If everyone can take their seats, we're getting ready to get started. How's everybody doing this evening? Who's happy that the rain has stopped? Yes, that was crazy this morning. It started, come on. All right, um, my name is Carmen Samuel, I'm the Associate Producer of Community Engagement here at NJPAC, and we are so happy again to have the Newark History Society. This is such a great partnership. You guys are such a cool bunch, this uh, volunteer crew, uh, the Newark History Society led by Tim, um, Tim Christ, and just a few housekeeping things before I introduce Tim Christ, who again needs no introduction. Um, there, is, there are some restrooms, so leaving the, leaving the room to your left, make a right. There's some restrooms, also a water fountain. Also, I just want to draw a couple of things to your attention before before we get started. Um, NJPAC has a free program called Stage Exchange, where three playwrights from three New Jersey theaters are going to put on a production of the play. However, we workshop them here. And so the next one is actually happening this Friday. If you would like free tickets, I can send out the, the link so that you guys can RSVP. It'll be right here on the stage, just as it's, it's presented right here. Secondly, we have another program by PSENG called True, True Diversity Film Series. Our last installment of it is actually happening on May 3rd. Um, the film that we're screening is called The Armor of Light. And so that is actually going to center around gun violence, which is very timely um, in today's world. So we're happy to put that on. And that's going to take place over at the um, Express Newark, which is across the New Haynes Building. And finally, Alvin Ailey, as they always do, are coming back. You can get 20% off tickets with this little code here, I'll leave that to you and won't insult your intelligence, you can read. Um, so without further ado, please welcome the wonderful leader of this wonderful program, Mr. Tim Christ. Thanks, Carmen. Uh, we are so grateful for this partnership with NJ NJPAC. Uh, uh, we uh, put on three programs a year here, plus a couple other programs elsewhere. But John Schreiber and NJPAC has, has really been a marvelous host 
uh, and supporter of the Newark History Society. I think most of you know that uh, a group of us started the Newark History Society 15 years ago. Uh, we are an all-volunteer organization. We have put on over 75 programs on different aspects of Newark's history during that period. Uh, we depend on the support of our members, and we did put a few membership cards out there on the, on the chair, chairs. Uh, some of you are, are uh, coming to your first Newark History Society program. I hope that after tonight you will want to come back to others. On June 18th at the New Jersey Historical Society, just a couple doors down the street, street we're going to have a program on Newark cider. Newark was more famous for its cider than anything else during its, uh, the first half of its existence. And we're going to talk about that in June, and there'll be some samples from the Ironbound Cider Company. Uh, in September, we're recalling Martin Luther King's uh, visit to Newark. Um, 50 years ago, just uh, a few days before his assassination. Uh, that program will be here on September 17th. And then in November, um, we are doing a program in conjunction with NJ Pack on Sarah Vaughan, um, uh, Newark's own. Uh, Walt Chambers will be one of the uh, panelists. Uh, Eileen Hayes, who is her, uh, Sarah Vaughn's recent biographer, will be uh, here for that program. And then looking into next year, we're still working on organizing a couple of the programs, but one is set. This just gives you an idea of the sorts of things we do next April 8th. Here, John Zinn and Laura Troiano will talk about two centuries of Newark baseball. Um, as the baseball season gets started, John Zinn is really into mid-19th century baseball, and Newark was one of the first. Um, and then Laura Troiano did her Rutgers PhD on um, Rupert Stadium and, and the baseball teams in the, in the 1930s. Uh, if you want to keep track of us, uh, we do our best to keep our website, NewarkHistorySociety.org, up to date, uh, our programs are videotaped and put on our um, YouTube site, uh, and a number of uh, uh, the texts of a number of the talks are also posted there. Uh, tonight, we are turning to the Germans of Newark. We've been wanting to do this program for a long time. Unfortunately, not that many people have been working on Germans in Newark, despite their importance in 19th century uh, Newark despite their driving force behind uh, Newark's rise as an industrial power. Um, and Tom Allroots was uh, teasing me the other day that uh, we came up with two non-German Americans to uh, guide us tonight, and I hope that's a spur to some of you in the audience. I know there's a number, a number here from the Deutscher Club um, in um, Union. Um, but and even the slideshow that greeted you uh, as we came um, uh, is also meant as a bit of a spur. Uh, I am not aware, and I, uh, Natalie knows more about Newark uh, uh, things than anybody else. I am not of anyone aware of anyone who has tried to collect photographs about German Americans in Newark, about their family life, about their churches, about their cultural events. And I would love to find somebody to uh, take the lead on such a project. Uh, there's a woman in Virginia who's already volunteered if she can work uh, remotely. Three of her grandparents were born in, um, in, uh, in Newark in the 19th century, of uh, German um, background. So let me plant that idea and hope that that will spark a conversation and perhaps a project um, uh, that will capture more of um, uh, German Newark. But tonight we have um, Natalie Borisovitz, uh, the librarian at Rutgers Newark, uh, the, uh, uh, the person behind the best bibliography uh, of, of Newark, the Newark experience on the Rutgers Newark um, uh, library uh, website, uh, and Dan O'Flaherty, uh, a professor of economics at uh, Columbia University and uh, no one more knowledgeable about uh, uh, Newark uh, uh, budgets and financial uh, matters over the uh, decades. 
And Dan, for years, has been wanting to really dig deeply to understand why the uh, German political presence in Newark fell off so suddenly uh, in the early part of the 20th century. So tonight, Natalie is, is uh, going to start by providing an overview of um, German Newark, and then Dan will follow with a discussion on, um, on the decline of uh, German influence, particularly in political life in Newark. So Natalie, we'll start with you, and afterwards we'll have a Q&A. We'll bring it down to my level here. <laughs> okay, well welcome. Uh, it's great to see so many people that were willing to risk whatever mother nature may have in mind next uh, to show up tonight. Um, how many people here are of German ancestry? Whoa. Okay, I better be really careful what I have to say. Uh, <laughs> and how many of those are, had family that came out of Newark? Okay, still a lot. <laughs> and still living here. Great. Okay, well, you're in good company. Um, the presence of Germans, or at least a German, in Newark goes back to the very first settlers. Uh, the records of the Milford First Church in the New Haven Colony show that Hans Albus, a German, was admitted to the church on July 3rd, 1663. In June 24th, 1667, Hans Albers, who we assume is the same person, uh, signed the Newark Fundamental Agreement and drew a home lot at the north end of town. Um, I'm not sure if I can see it from here. Oh, didn't mean to do that, sorry. <laughs> They're giving me multiple things and I'm not so good at it. So um, he, he drew lot Q, uh, a nice corner lot on uh, High Street there. Um, but for a long time, Albers was pretty much it for Germans in Newark. Despite the fact that Germans made up the largest group of non-English speaking immigrants into English North America in the 18th century, it wasn't until the 19th century that Germans began to come to Newark in any significant number. Prior to the 19th century, uh, the ships carrying German immigrants didn't come into the port of New York, they came into the port of Philadelphia. So while there was a sizable population of Germans in New Jersey, they were actually in Western and Southern Jersey. They never made it all the way up here. On the other hand, the population of Pennsylvania became so heavily German that in 1755, Benjamin Franklin protested that, why should Pennsylvania, founded by the English, become a colony of aliens who will shortly be so numerous as to Germanize us instead of our anglifying them, and will never adopt our language or customs any more than, than they acquire our complexion. <laughs> there. <laughs> uh, well, uh, Ben was right about some things. Um, Germans, not just in Pennsylvania, but in other areas where they settled, such as Newark, uh, did over time transform the culture, the economy, the educational systems, even the food habits of, the pe of those places. But they also assimilated, earning their hyphens as German Americans, um, although there were some American customs that they would fight vigorously for many, many, many decades. After the 1820s, New York became the primary port for German immigration, and now there started to be Germans coming into Newark. Um, slowly, but coming in. So in 1835, there were about 300 Germans in Newark. By 1850, almost 10% of the population, about 3,500 residents, were German-born. By 1880, 30% of the population of Newark, over 40,000 residents, hence all of you, were either German-born or had at least one parent who was German-born. The biggest concentration of Germans lived on the hill, uh, the area going up from the triangle at High and Springfield, uh, the old 6th and 7th wards. When the Germans started moving in there, uh, it consisted mostly of undeveloped land, some factories, some of it was swampland, the hill continued to be the German neighborhood in Newark. Although there was an overflow neighborhood, 
Whoa, again, I'm using the wrong. Apparently, I shouldn't have more than one. Okay, so the iron bound also had this um, over sizable, I don't even call it, if you can call it overflow, uh, neighborhood uh, that also developed. And um, the large German breweries were primarily in the iron bound, so many of the brewery employees lived there, um, and, and a lot of the uh, owners of the brewers as well. It, it in some ways became like a feeder neighborhood, so the recently arrived would start in the iron bound, as their economic status improved, they'd move to or toward the hill, while other hill residents would move to another part of the city or even out of the city. And as could be expected, as more and more Germans came into the city, they began to build a German-based infrastructure. So in 1833, the first German church, St. John's First German Evangelical Lutheran, opened on what is now Halsey Street. Um, in 1851, which is that list on the left, there were 41 churches in Newark. Seven of them were German, uh, which means that while only 10% of the population was German, 20% of the churches were German. Uh, 10 years later, um, there were 12 German churches. And as you can see, the Germans were not exactly united in their faith. So uh, we, had, um, we had two Presbyterian, two Evangelical Lutheran, a Baptist, a Reformed Dutch, two Episcopal, two Catholic, two Methodist, um, and a synagogue. Uh, there's a tendency to look at Germans in Newark and Jews in Newark as, as very separate entities, but until the latter part of the 19th century, most Newark Jews were German Jews. And congregation uh, B'nai Yasserun, the oldest Jewish congregation in Newark, was founded in 1848 by German Jews. Um, the synagogue was erected in 1858, and Rabbi Isaac Schwartz came to Newark in 1853 from Bavaria. In 1856, the first secular German school is opened on Green Street. By the 1890s, there would be 14 German-English schools with an enrollment of over 3,700 students in Newark. Um, in 1869, the Newark Board of Education appointed Henry W. Pauley, who previously taught at the 12th Ward German School, which we see here, uh, as a, term, a teacher of German in the public schools. The idea was that uh, they were hoping that to get the German language um, as part of the curriculum in all the primary schools. That happened in some places. It happened in Hoboken. Um, it didn't actually happen in Newark. They kind of started it, but it was a little bit half-hearted. But um, German was a regular part of the curriculum in the high schools. In 1871, the German Street School offered the first kindergarten in Newark. Other schools, both German and public, soon followed. Under the influence of the Turners, the German Gymnastic Association, physical education was introduced into the schools as well. Unlike the Irish immigrants, most of whom were general laborers, factory workers, or in service, the Germans tended to be in skilled trades or involved in food or dry goods, so they were tanners, jewelers, tailors, and artisans. If it had something to do with food or drink, the Germans were there. Okay. They ran the restaurants and the saloons. Most of Newark's butchers and confectioners were German. Germans comprised practically the total membership of the Bakery Workers Union. Uh, they ran the grocery stores and the delicatessens. German Jews had the leading dry goods stores. And of course, then there were the department stores. Julius Hain came from Saxony as a teenager in the 1840s, and in 1858 opened a bird cage and toy store on Broad Street. Um, retail in the 19th century was very, very specialized. Um, by the 1870s, Hain had expanded to general merchandise, which was actually sort of a revolutionary thing at the time. Eventually, his sons would open the first great department store in Newark. And then, of course, there were people like Louis Bamberger, a second-generation German-American who was not only one of Newark's most famous citizens, but a tremendous benefactor of, to the fabric of the city. 
Yep, that's true. And, and of course, there were the brewers. Um, Newark has been called the pre-prohibition beer capital of the United States. Um, in the late 1840s, German brewers brought bottom fermenting lager beer yeast from Europe. I don't know what that means, but I do know that because they did, they were able to produce the Bavarian style lagers that soon became the beer choice in America. Uh, especially in the earlier years, local breweries were of, often at the heart of every neighborhood. Brewmasters were sort of treated like local royalty. And the large brewery owners, men like Gottfried Kruger, Joseph Hensler, the Salk brothers, built large production plants, again, mostly in the Ironbound, employed many, many people, and became quite wealthy. Ballantyne might have been the most famous of the Newark breweries. Peter Ballantyne was a Scot. Uh, but in 1870, of the 278 men who identified themselves as brewers, 237 were of German birth. Uh, Newark had a fresh water supply and easy access to the New York market. Uh, so it was in a great position to become a brewing center. In 1870, beer was Newark's fifth largest industry. In 1890, it was the second most profitable product right behind leather goods. And so it's no wonder that the brewers developed a lot of political clout, not just in Newark, but statewide as well. So who knows what PON stands for? All right, this is a good group. There will be periodical quizzes as we go through. Okay, well, you did too well on that one. Let's see how you do on this one. How many of you are familiar with the German naturalist Alexander von Humboldt? Mm, not, not as many as are familiar with beer. What does that say? Okay. Well, uh, in the 19th century, everybody would have raised their hand because uh, everybody knew about von Humboldt. Um, he was touted as the second Columbus, the scientific discoverer of America. Emerson called him one of the wonders of the world. He was obviously um, a tremendous source of pride to Germans everywhere. And September 14th, 1869 was the 100th anniversary of his birth. And there were celebrations literally across the country from Boston to San Francisco. And Newark had their own three day celebration. And it, that celebration not only celebrated the memory of Unhumbled, but it showcased the German citizens of Newark and what they were able to accomplish. So um, they started on Monday night, on September 13th, uh, with the grand dramatic performance at the Opera House of The Huguenots, a drama in five acts. And then they finished on Wednesday, September 15th, when some 3,000 people, including ex-governor Marcus Ward, attended the grand concert and ball at the rink, uh, where they were entertained by the German United Singing Societies and a demonstration by the Turners. But the principal celebration was on Tuesday, the day of the actual anniversary. And as most celebrations did in those days, they started with a parade. And on the right there from that news clipping, you see who was in that parade. So among the marchers were 12 German singing societies, multiple bands, multiple dramatic associations, several societies of turners, seven benevolent associations, six fraternal associations, and all the usual politicians. <laughs> so uh, the parade started at 10 a.m. And in addition to the marchers, there were 40 or 50 carriages in the procession. Uh, homes and factories along the route were decorated, many flying German and American flags. On Broad Street, flags flew from public buildings, banks, and stores. And as the parade passed the schools, the students would come out of their classrooms waving their handkerchiefs. Um, the Newark Evening Courier declared that the 14th of September may properly be set down as a genuine red letter holiday in our municipal calendar. At about 11 a.m., the parade arrived at their destination, the corner of Wallace and Newton, pretty much at the outskirts of town and the edge of the hill. And there, among much fanfare and the usual speechifying, they laid the cornerstone for the new Newark German Hospital, 
the first secular Newark hospital. Uh, the Episcopalians had built St. Barnabas in 1865 and the Catholics in St. Michael's in 1866. Um, there had been a, a Newark hospital group that had been dittering about building a, build, a city hospital since 1857. Um, they got absolutely nowhere. The Germans got impatient, because they're efficient people, uh, and uh, they decided they weren't going to wait any longer and they brought together representatives of 62 German associations and in a remarkably short amount of time raised the money to build the Newark German Hospital, which they stressed would be open to everyone. They came, they built it, and the first baby born there in July of 1871 was named Alexander Humboldt Kuhn. <laughs> so, those multiple German associations, the singing societies, the fraternal associations, the lodges, the turners, these were a hallmark of German American society in the 19th and the early 20th century. The rest of the city pretty much saw Germans as this single group who spoke the same language. But there was no Germany as a country until the unification of the German states in 1871. So these were people from Baden, from Bavaria, from Hesse, from Saxony, from Alsace Lorraine. Um, they didn't all speak the same German. They weren't coming from identical cultures. They may have been coming from places where they didn't get along so well with each other. And as you saw from that previous list of German churches, they certainly did not agree on religion. Um, they were joiners, but they didn't want to belong to the same associations. Mostly they wanted to hang out with people who came from where they came from. Uh, which is sort of normal. In fact, there was only one thing they all seemed to agree on. Any guesses? <laughs> Not exactly, but yeah. <laughs> they agreed on how they wanted to spend their Sundays, which in the end sort of came down to beer. Um, <clears throat> So through most of the 19th century, every state had blue laws, laws designed to keep the Sabbath holy, holy being defined pretty much as a day spent in church and quiet contemplation. The New Jersey blue laws weren't quite as draconian as those of the New Haven colony under which Newark's original settlers lived, where deliberate desecration of the Lord's day could result in death, um, but pretty much anything that would get in the way of sober reflection was forbidden. Um, so as you see from that excerpt from the 1855 New Jersey laws, that meant on Sunday, no traveling, worldly employment or business, ordinary, ordinary or servile labor or work, no shooting, fishing, hunting, sporting, gunning, racing, or frequenting of tippling houses, no interludes or plays, dancing, singing, fiddling, or other music for the sake of merriment, or any playing at football fives, nine-pin bowls, or any other kind of playing sports pastimes or diversion. And what you see here is only the first section. There were several others. So, for example, there were restrictions on travel except to church and things like that. And this concept of what the proper way to spend Sunday was something that was ingrained in the American psyche. Um, so there was an outcry in Newark when the railroad increased the number of trains running between New York City and Newark on Sundays because it was an indication that people weren't tra were traveling for pleasure and not just out of necessity. In 1887, the Law and Order League demanded the arrest of members of the Architectural League, Architectural League in New York City because they had a show of architectural drawings that was open on Sunday. Now, you can just ima imagine the level of merriment at a show of architectural drawings. Um, but keeping the Sabbath holy was considered a critical aspect of American life. It was seen as something quintessentially American, something necessary to preserve the American family and the American way of life. Um, the thinking was that if you didn't understand that, you didn't understand what it meant to be an American. However, in Europe, both Catholics and Protestants celebrated Sunday as a feast day. Um, for Germans especially, it was a day for families to gather, to visit with friends, to visit restaurants, taverns, beer gardens. This was part of their cycle of weekly life. As far as they were concerned, the way to keep the Sabbath holy was to celebrate it. 
And since it was the one thing that the Germans all agreed on, that became the line in the sand. As historian Luke Ritter, who uh, studies the Germans in St. Louis, has pointed out, for German immigrants, celebrating the Lord's Day in their own way came to mean assimilating on their own terms, and Sunday observance became a symbol of both resistance to dominant American culture and solidarity among the German-American minorities. And while the Blue Laws clearly were not just about liquor, or tippling as we have here, um, liquor quickly became the focal point of the argument. So uh, this is an illustration that appeared in Harper's Weekly in 1859. And uh, it's part of a five-part series. And the title of the series was Sketches of the People Who Oppose Our Sunday Laws. Um, as you can tell, they were not in favor. Um, in 1853, the Germans in Newark petitioned the Newark Common Council to ease the Sunday restrictions, arguing that the blue laws deny the capacity of man for self-government, are subversive of the principle of freedom and equality by preventing the free use of those things which nature and civilization have developed and sanctioned. They pointed out that there was scientific proof that the exclusive use of water was noxious to the system. <laughs> they had proof. Um, they pointed out that it, it, they did, did it dedicate Sundays not only to pious contemplation, but also to rest, recreations, and amusements. And that Sunday was the only day that the laborer actually had to participate in any recreation. And then they ended, perhaps not wisely, uh, that it is the urgent duty of our fellow citizens to unite with us in a decided refusal to support any candidate for public office that may have pledged himself to the modern temperance reformers. Well, as you can tell by the title of this subsequent publication, which characterized their petition as demanding the virtual repeal of the laws which forbid Sabbath tippling and Sabbath desecration, it didn't go over well. Um, the council unanimously found that the demands are of such a character as to call for a prompt, clear, and unequivocal refusal on the part of the city authorities to entertain a proposition so immoral in its tendency and so destructive to the peace and good order of the community. And they also uh, directed the city marshal and his assistants and all other executive police officers to enforce strictly and rigorously the laws and ordinances for the preservation of tranquility of the Sabbath and for the suppression of the traffic in intoxicating liquors. Well, this was a battle that was going to go on for the rest of the century and into the 20th. It was a battle that was replicated in all American cities that had a significant German population. It was a battle that literally drove Germans out of town on Sundays. Uh, so in Newark and elsewhere, if you didn't want to be hassled on Sundays, you went to the country, uh, to parks, beer gardens, at the edges or outside the city limits. Um, in New York, New York City, which of course had a huge German population, the country actually meant taking the ferry to Hoboken, uh, where in the, at the Elysian Fields they could picnic and drink beer in peace, at least mostly in peace. There were some incidents. Um, I'd always heard that Hoboken had more bars per square mile than any other city in New Jersey, and now I know why. Okay. So in Newark, the Sunday question became the central issue on which municipal elections were won and lost. In 1879, William Fiedler, running as a Democrat and backed by the large German voting bloc, became the first German mayor of the city of Newark, beating the law and order Republican candidate by 3,000 votes, a, a sizable majority in those days. Unfortunately, the rest of the council remained Republican, so there wasn't much he could do about anything. Um, he only served one uh, term as mayor, but he did go on to serve in the US Congress um, in 18, from 1883 to 1885 as a Republican. They went back and forth a bit. Uh, uh, 
up to up to the Civil War, uh, majority of Germans were were Republicans. Afterwards, uh, there was much more of a split. By the 20th century, um, the greater number were Democrats or liberals, as they were known sometimes. Um, the political party of the Germans, and especially the German-dominated New Jersey Brewers Association, continued to grow. In 1887, the Law and Order League, which consisted almost exclusively of Republicans, in alliance with the Prohibitionists, also Republicans, and apparently in retaliation against the state Republican convention for refusing to take a stand on the Sunday question out of fear of the Germans, got the Republican candidate for mayor defeated in favor of Joseph E. Haynes, a Democrat, and one emphatically not in favor of closing the saloons on Sunday. Uh, which just goes to show you that politics then was no more logical than politics today. Um, although the Republican convention did seem to get the message, uh, at their 1888 convention, although while not specifically mentioning the Sunday question, they did pledge themselves to the protection of the homes of the people by the due restriction of vice and intemperance, and congratulated the state legislature on their honest, earnest, and courageous efforts to restrain the evils of the liquor trade. So, 1906 was a pretty good year for Germans in Newark. In 1906, J Jacob Hausling, whose father had come to Newark from Bavaria, was elected to the first of four terms as mayor, the third German to, ser to serve as mayor of Newark. Uh, the Democrats had nominated Hausling as the anti-Sunday law candidate, um, and at in 1906, the Sunday Law uh, was uh, what was termed the Bishop's Law, uh, which had uh, passed that summer and was aimed at giving teeth to actually enforcing the existing laws, which had always been an issue, at least as they pertain to alcohol. Uh, the Bishop's Law allowed for license revocation and stiff fines for saloons calling caught selling liquor on Sundays. It also required, and this was actually the big thing, that all screens on windows in saloons had to be removed on Sunday. Uh, so the usual practice of locking the front door and putting up the screens on the windows so nobody could see in, and then just coming in through the side door, wouldn't work anymore. Um, it was a very unpopular law in Newark and pretty much elsewhere. Um, Hausling won easily and proved to be an extremely popular mayor. In, the, in fact, in the 1910 election, the Republicans um, tried to get rid of him by selecting another respected German-American, businessman Edward E. Knichtel, to run against Hausling in an attempt to unseat him and the Democratic Party, and Hausling still won easily. 1906 was also the year of the Newark Sangerfest. As we have seen, music was always of tremendous importance to Germans in Newark, indeed Germans everywhere. It was largely due to the influence of the Germans that music, especially choral music, became part of the curricula in the Newark schools. The Newark Singing Societies were members of the Northeast Sangerbund, the northeastern chapter of the National German Singing Society. This uh, Sangerbud had this uh, huge triennial festival that literally brought thousands of people into the host cities. Newark had hosted the festival in 1891, and it had been a tremendous success on all fronts, musical and financial. Uh, the city was flooded by participants and spectators. It was reported that 10,000 men marched in the parade on the last day, and some 70,000 people attended the closing picnic in Caledonian Park. So in 1906, Newark was again chosen to host the Sangerfest. It was again a great success, with some 5,000 singers from 40 cities participating and 25,000 spectators crowding into Olympic Park on a daily basis. And of course, after the concerts and the competitions, a good time was had by all. So, the Newark Sunday Call had a number of stories relating to the Sangerfest that they ran the week before the festival, including one on the nearly 3,000 children from the Newark Public Schools that had been selected to give a concert in conjunction with the Sangerfest. And as you will recall, the reason that there was choral music programs in the public schools was because of the Germans. 
There was also an editorial, one that easily and somewhat eerily could be read as a direct response to Ben Franklin's comments on Germans 150 years earlier. So the editorial starts by saying that even 25 years ago, you could find references to the German element or the German voter or the German opinion in Newark as if the Germans were a separate group outside the majority. But they say they have been united with and absorbed by American citizenship. So there you are, Ben Franklin. Um, and it continued to say if the German has been assimilated, the American has undergone somewhat the same process. For what the German citizen of Newark has done to the city, every Newarker has cause for eternal gratitude. More than to any other people is due to Germans the credit for liberalizing public sentiment in Old Puritan Newark. No people have done more toward securing independence of political judgment. None have contributed more to firmly establish the principles of business integrity. Their delight in home and children and respect for age have influenced the whole city and in the matter which brings the Sangerfest to Newark, the advancement of music, a lasting debt for culture is due. The changes have been great indeed, and all for the better. So the Germans have arrived at the point where not only are they accepted and integrated, at least some of their contributions to Newark are recognized and acknowledged, because there are many others that have become such an integral part of daily life that most people have forgotten that they originated with the Germans. Unfortunately, the euphoria of 1906 wasn't going to last. Things were going to take a decidedly downward turn. Not immediately, but soon. But I'll let Dan tell you about that part. Hi, uh, I'm Dan, I'm not German, and I don't know how to pronounce German names, and most of the people I'm going to talk about have been dead for 100 years, uh, but I'm going to do my best. Uh, it took a lot of work to put this together, mainly by other people in the Newark History Society. Uh, it was a great example of an intellectual community where every question I had, somebody in the group had an answer to. I call that intellectual community, they call it Dan is a Parasite. <laughs> Uh, let me start talking about what happened next and what happened is very strange and took me I wanted to figure out what happened back to Jacob Housling um, mayor of Newark from 1906 to 1914 um, very interesting character. He began campaigning. He ran for mayor every two years. Uh, he, every night when he was campaigning, he started at 7 p.m., uh, kept going at places that he knew until dawn, and kept getting elected. Um, okay. Many, four time mayor. Uh, and on February 20, he left office on December 31st, 1914. Uh, and on February 26th, uh, 1921, uh, he went to his bathroom in his house on High Street, uh, stabbed himself repeatedly, and bled to death. Um, his wife, uh, whose name was not quoted in the Times, said that everybody left him. Uh, his life went downhill tremendously in the years after that. Um, she did not leave him. Um, many other things changed in Newark between 1914 and 1921, uh, besides uh, Jacob Housling's fortunes. Um, Okay, when he left office, the German Americans in elected office were all over the place. Mayor dominating the Board of Water, Street and Water Commissioners, the trustees of the city home, over a quarter of the aldermen. 
when he died, there were no Germans in office, in elected office in Newark. Uh, since Mayor Hausling's passing, there has been one German-American who to hold elected office in Newark, Frederick Breedenbach, who had a short and undistinguished term on the commission and as mayor between 1922 and 1925. Um, the whole transition, in fact, wasn't this eight years of housling. It took place in eight weeks in 1917. Okay, um, my question tonight is why? Okay, one possibility, there are a lot of things that happened. Uh, I'll come to that. The, the prevailing story that you, you sort of hear is natural succession. Uh, this, this rising escalator uh, that Germans moved out of Newark, things went gradually, things went peacefully, uh, they went to greener pastures and were succeeded by other ethnic groups. Ethnic groups come in, they get better and better, and then they leave and other ones come behind them. This is a benign story, it's a boring story, and that's why nobody has ever studied this seriously. It's really boring, it seems. Uh, the problem is, it's not true. Um, my, there are two other possibilities, both 1917. Two important things happened in, in Newark in 1917. Anti-German prejudice, which I'll talk about, and the change of, of government form from the aldermanic form uh, to the commission form. Um, there are different possibilities. In the end, I'll try to convince you that anti-German prejudice connected with World War I is the most plausible story, but let's go through the, the other possibilities. Um, I'll talk about what are the possibilities, look seriously at it, and, and what happened, and why it probably matters. Okay, what are the problems with natural, the, the natural succession escalator story? Um, there was a decrease in German immigrant population between 1910 and not 1920, but not by a lot, about 36%. Uh, but if you, cr part of the problem is that Germany's boundaries changed. Germany lost about 10% of its population, so you would have had a 10% decrease if nothing else happened. Um, Irish immigrant population fell by almost as much. Natural succession implies a slow process. Escalators move slowly. This was not an escalator, it was a um, Natural succession also implies that Germans should be succeeded by newer immigrant groups. People down, well, coming up. That would be the Germans and the, that would be the Italians and the Jews. But they were not. Uh, in fact, Italian and Jewish representation was wiped out at the same time that German representation was wiped out. Uh, Italians had been represented in New York City government since Lorenzo Buscano uh, was elected in the 15th Ward in 1905. Uh, Jews at least since Louis Semmel in 1907 in the Third Ward, though they were all gone uh, for at least 16 years after 1917. Um, so natural, let's look at how things changed big kinds of numbers. It wasn't the, the Italians and Jews who succeeded, it was the Irish. Um, Germans went from 11 to nothing, Irish went to 12 to three, but three is 60% is of the people who were elected. Um, in fact, the first Irish mayor, Charles Gillen, was elected in 1917. There had never been an Irish mayor before then, and after the commission there was only one Irish mayor. Um, at the same time, if you look at winning elections in, in Newark, you don't see anything falling off before 1917 as you would in a natural succession story. Uh, 1910, five Germans are elected in the 1916, seven Germans are elected. There's no trend there. Okay. Um, so there's no downward trend. What happened? Did Germans leave Newark overnight in 1916? The end of 1916, this is not a plausible story. So there's no naturalness, there's, there's no succession. The, the natural succession story does not work. Uh, next possible story is anti-German prejudice. Um, there was a very remarkable period of anti-German prejudice in the United States starting around 1914 and 
going for about a decade or so. Um, in, was, it was transitory. In 1908, as, as Natalie demonstrated, Germans were a ad, very much admired group within the United States. In 1933, Germans were an admired group within the United States. In between, there was a decade of strong animosity. Um, it was only a decade, but it was a decade that is key to the, the story of what happened in Newark. Okay, what happened nationally? I'm, I'm drawing on a, a paper by Petra Moser. Um, what kind of evidence in, in, she looks at the Metropolitan Opera uh, before 1914, about 40% of the operas that the Met, the Met presented were in German. By 1917, that had declined to 7%. Uh, she looks at elections to seats on the New York Stock Exchange. Uh, the rate of rejection of Germans doubled between 1914 and 1918. Uh, many cities and states banned teaching of the German language in public schools. A uh, number of New York City clubs, like the New York Athletic Club, banned speaking German on, the prejudice, on their premises. Uh, we had Liberty Cabbage. Um, the consumption of sauerkraut in the United States fell 75% during the war, even though sauerkraut uh, was a Belgian dish, uh, and, but the makers of sauerkraut, sauerkraut decided they would try to call it Liberty Cabbage to, to sell some of it. Uh, Liberty Steak, you know what Liberty Steak is. Hamburgers. Um, and Liberty Dogs. Dachshunds. And nobody called them Frankfurters anymore, and that's how we got hot dogs. So some of it was, was kind of silly. Uh, other parts were not. A, a German-American named Robert Prager was lynched uh, in Illinois, uh, and a number of people were charged. They were all acquitted. Uh, Germans reacted uh, to this by doing things to seem less German. The number of babies named Otto and Wilhelm took a distinct de decline starting in 1915 uh, and, and moving on. So nationally, there is a lot of evidence starting in 1914 of, of anti-German animosity. What about Newark? Uh, from, what we can, from what I can see, what, there wasn't much going on of anti-German prejudice in Newark before 1917, so 14, 15, 16. Um, the 250th anniversary musical uh, had a, a large proportion of music by German composers. Uh, George Robb has looked at the, the New York newspapers. They were not as anti-Germany as the New York City papers. I showed you the, the elections. There's nothing going on there. Um, and even in, in 1916 and 1917, well into the war, German is by far the most popular language in, in, Germ in Newark high schools. Uh, 2,000 enrollments versus 600 for the next, for French. Uh, almost a third of Newark German high school students were studying German and only a third of Newark High School students were on college prep track. Um, but after, once in 1917, 1918, a lot of anti-German activity goes on in Newark. Um, the federal government cracks down. Uh, they raided the Free Zeitung, uh, a, a German language newspaper. Uh, they expropriated the Kruger, Kruger Brewery. Um, the library was pressured to remove pro-German books. I am wrong there. Uh, they did not remove them, but they came into a, a lot of criticism for not removing them. Um, the school administration dropped the German language. Uh, they allowed people continuing. Newark German Hospital changed its name. It became Newark Memorial Hospital. Changed its name again in 1952 to Clara Moss. Uh, and the street name changes in 1918. Uh, Okay, April 1918, the 10th Ward Saratella Political Club uh, petitioned the commission to change the names of German streets. The 10th Ward uh, is the southern part of the Ironbound, basically south of Delancey Street. Um, that, it's, a street, it's a street activity, it's in Commissioner Raymond's bailiwick. Uh, Commissioner Raymond's mother was German. Uh, and on May 9th, he came back with a proposal. It was accepted 4-0. Uh, Commissioner Brennan uh, was absent. Most of the streets involved in this 
were not in the 10th Ward. What happened? Bismarck Avenue became Pershing Avenue. This is on the other side, on off McClellan Street, um, behind uh, the Pennsylvania Railroad. If you looked at it, I mean, it doesn't make any sense. You've got Garibaldi Avenue, you should have Bismarck Avenue. But it became Pershing Avenue. It's always been Pershing Avenue. Uh, Bremen Street became Marne Street after the Battle of the Marne, which Germany lost. Uh, that's, that's in the Iron Bound off, off Wilson Avenue. Uh, Berlin Street, uh, also, in, in the, also in the 12th Ward, became Rome Street. Uh, Frankfurt Street became Paris Street. Uh, Dresden Street became London Street. London Street. Where's London Street? Well, where's Rome Street? And where's Paris Street? London Street became Route 1. Uh, 1914 maps have it. Uh, German Street in, in the Central Ward between South 10th Street and South 11th Street by Westside Park became Belgium Street. Um, Frederick Street became Sum Street, another battle which maybe the Germans lost. That's next to, that's the eastern boundary of, of Riverbank Park. And Hamburg Place became Wilson Avenue. Although Woodrow Wilson lost Newark in 1912 and 1916, <laughs> uh, and is responsible for all kinds of things, it became Wilson Avenue. Now that Wilson's name is being taken off other things, um, but I'm not sure if we called it Hamburg Place, if we said Hamburg Place, then everybody thinks it's a fast food restaurant. If we call it Hamburg Place, everybody thinks it's a hat store. But still, there's, 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 you're, you're not destroying history. Um, do these things matter? Yeah, they matter a lot. They matter to how people look at their lives. If you look at the controversy today about Confederate statues, they matter to a lot of people. I suspect that if the New York City Council were to seriously entertain the idea of changing Martin Luther King Boulevard to Jefferson Davis Street uh, or Roberto Clemente's school to Donald Trump's school, uh, somebody might say something, but nobody said anything in 1918 when this happened. Uh, okay, so that's one possibility. We know that there's this going on uh, in Newark in 1917, not in 1916. The alternative story is you had another big change in Newark, which was that there was a whole different form of government that came in. Um, maybe the kind of, of government the Germans just didn't get there. It's a good explanation for why Jewish and Italian representation was wiped out in 1917. Maybe the same thing is, was true for Newark, for, for Germans. Um, what do we need this, for, for this kind of story to work? Uh, we need that the change of government had to be motivated by anti-German prejudice or was not motivated by anti-German prejudice, so I had to examine that. And in the absence of anti-German president, would it have cut anti, would have cut German representation? I'll deal with each question in turn. Was the change to the commission form of government an anti-German move? Why, why did Newark go to commission government, which was the ditziest form of government ever? Uh, and um, was what did it actually cut German representation the same way did it cut Italian and Jewish? Okay, I got to give you some background because most of you probably don't understand Newark government of 1910. Uh, how many of you? Oh, no. Okay. okay, so it was aldermanic government which was based on the 1859 charter. Um, there are partisan elections every year. Um, they loved having elections. Uh, there were 16 wards after 1908. Uh, each ward elected an alderman for a two-year term, and so there were 32 aldermen, one run every year. Uh, there was a board of street and water commissioners, very powerful board, uh, controlled the biggest departments. It also uh, controlled the development of the port and the meadows. Um, there were five members elected for three years. The city home trustees, the city home was a reform school in Verona. Uh, it ha was governed by a board of seven trustees. It included the mayor, two members selected by the common council, and four members who were elected. Um, 
the mayor was a very weak position. Before 1908, uh, there was a 32-member Board of Education also, uh, two from each ward. I haven't really analyzed those elections yet. Um, it's crazy. Um, so there, have been, there were proposals all along to change it. Uh, Mayor Housling proposed it, made a proposal in 1911, Mayor Raymond in 1916. Mainly they wanted to have a strong mayor and a five-member legislator. Uh, but you can't do that. The charter was an act of the legislature, so everything had to go to the legislature. There's amendment, amendment after amendment uh, that, that goes to the legislature. The legislature sets the, the salaries and things like that. Uh, neither Raymond nor Housling was successful in getting the charter changed. But along comes commission government. Okay, what is commission government? Uh, this is a form of government that became popular with progressives after the hurricane in Galveston destroyed the town. Five businessmen were put in charge. Forget representation, forget uh, accountability, forget checks and balances. Each had their own department, and they were both legislators and administrators. Um, became popular in 1911. The New Jersey legislature passed, and Governor Wilson signed the Walsh Act, another reason why they could call it Hamburg Place. Um, which let New, New Jersey municipalities adopt the conviction form without going to the legislature. For cities of Newark size, that's the first time it happens. Now we have the Faulkner Act and all of these things, but then it's the only thing you could do without going to the legislature. Um, takes a petition and is a very fast timetable. Um, so how did Newark get the commission? Uh, it starts with a, a group in Clinton Hill uh, that tried to put it on the ballot in 1914. Uh, they did not get enough signatures. Um, they kept trying, but did not get it very far. Um, then, 1916, 1917, James Nugent and Uzel McCarter get into a fight with Mayor Raymond. Who are they? Uh, James Nugent was the corporation counsel under Housling. Uh, but more important than that, he was the state Democratic chairman uh, till 1911, and after 1911, he was just still the Essex County Democratic chairman. Uzel McCarter was one of the three McCarter brothers. Uh, he was the one uh, that founded Fidelity Bank. Um, to get rid of Raymond, what do they do? In the old days, they'd have to fight it out. Now, they team up with Clinton Hill, they get the signatures, and they push the commission really fast. Uh, on September 22nd, they file the petitions. The city clerk, Alexander Archibald, who's a Nugent person, certifies them. Uh, October 9th, the referendum is held. It's a vote of 19,000 to 6,000, despite Raymond's opposition. Um, 19,000 generally doesn't win a mayoral election at that point, but 19,000 did then. The election for first commissioners is held November 13th. The new government took office November 20th. And this is the election that wiped out German-American representation. Um, so conclusion, conclusion one, the change was not motivated by anti-German prejudice or by anti-Italian prejudice or anti-Jewish prejudice. Uh, it was a clever move by Nugent uh, that just happened to wipe out Italian representation and Jewish representation. Uh, when I was in City Hall, we had a, a saying that uh, when the elephants fight, the ants get trampled. Uh, so the elephants are Nugent and, and Raymond and McCarter and the ants are the Italians and the Jews. Okay. So was this change responsible also for wiping out German representation that got wiped out at the same time? That's the second question. Was there something else? To do that, we have to take more of a look. Look at the first commission election. Great election. There were 80 candidates for five seats. Uh, it was a paper ballot where you could actually choose up to four. Uh, and it was 32 inches long. Uh, there were some slates and there were some independents. The Nugent slate was Archibald, Monahan, Hahn, Mitchell, and Bianchi. 
Um, the Republican organization slate was Bach, Breedenbach, Gunter, Denman, who is not German, and Johnson, uh, but mainly uh, Democratic. There were strong uh, independent slates. Uh, Housling uh, was, was on the ballot. Uh, Charles Gillen, who had uh, run against Nugent uh, for board of, of, uh, the Board of Works in 1915, was on there. Uh, William Haas was on there, had just done a tremendous uh, success uh, in, in the uh, Board of Works election in 1916. And the sheriff of, of Essex County, uh, Ralph Schmidt, was there. Uh, what happened? Okay, first place is Gillen. Second place is Raymond, the incumbent mayor. Third place is Brennan, the, the, the justice's father. Fourth is Archibald. Interesting how city clerks do well. And fifth was Monaghan. So the last two are, are Nugent people. Uh, there are no, no Jews, no Italians, no Germans, lots of Irish. Uh, there's actually nobody from the North Ward, nobody from the South Ward. Two people from downtown, one person from the Ironbound, one person from Roseville, one person from Valesburg. And it stayed that way approximately until 1933. Uh, where are the Germans? They're all down there. Bach is the closest. Bach is the guy who developed Weequake. Uh, Breedenbach is 10th. Hausling. Haas is 26th. Okay. Where are the Italians and Jews? Bianchi was... was, was Vote fighter for Nugent, came in 22nd, other people got in. Uh, Mancusi and Garrow did quite well. Uh, you saw the Jews who came in in the top 20. There weren't any. Uh, although Jews had done well under, under the, the aldermanic form. Uh, so what explains the disappearance of the Jews? Um, and, and the Italians, it's, it's pretty common. Um, at large elections are not good for minorities. This is well known in political science, well, well known in economics. Um, that that's, was the big fight in 1954. Um, so does, does this explain Germans too? I don't think so. Uh, you have to look in more detail. Um, Germans continue to, we, we saw a similar change from aldermanic form to commission form in 1913 in Jersey City, but Germans continued on the commission in 1913 in Jersey City. But also, we have to look a bit more seriously. The claim is that minority groups, like Germans, were, don't do well in at-large elections where, for some reason, Irish do. Did Germans do poorly in at-large elections before 1917? No way. Uh, here's more detail comparing within a, with doing lots of, of things of how things come out. Uh, and Germans basically did fine in at-large elections. You see them all over the city home. You see them all over the, the Board of Public Works. You see them electing mayors. Um, if you look at the Nugent as a Democratic ticket, Hahn should have run about 1,000 votes ahead of Monaghan. He ran 5,000 votes behind. Um, Republicans had been winning at-large elections. They ran with a heavily German ticket, and it did not do very well at all. Uh, or compare two people whose names start with BRE, Breedenbach and Brennan, about the same age, uh, both never run before, both on the police commission, but Breedenbach is the president of it. Brennan's running without organization support. Breedenbach is running with Republican organization support. Breedenbach is a lifelong Newarker. Brennan is, is an immigrant, more Germans in Newark than Irish. Breedenbach is clearly the stronger ticket stronger candidate in every way. Brennan gets 15,000 votes. Breedenbach doesn't clear 10,000. Uh, or Haas and Gillen, both running for Board of Works. Um, Haas got 17,000 more votes than Gillen in 1916, but was 12,000 votes behind Gillen uh, in 1917. Okay. So anti-German prejudice, I think, is, is the story. Uh, did it matter? Okay, things don't always get better. The benign and boring story isn't right. Newarkers made two big mistakes in 1917. Did it matter? Okay, I think it mattered a lot. Uh, now, Housling is, this, is always portrayed as this colorful character. 
But Central High School opened when Housling was mayor. Eastside High School opened when Housling was mayor, and he controlled the board. Shabazz High School opened when Housling was mayor. Okay. When Housling was mayor, three comprehensive high schools were opened. In the 37 years of the commission, two comprehensive high schools were opened. Was this a time of growth? In, this was a time of tremendous growth of high school going by people in the United States. In 1910, 9% of young people graduated from high school. In 1940, 40%. Newark did not keep up with that. Would Newark have done better if Germans had remained involved a little while longer? Possibly. Uh, if Italians and Jews had had more of a voice, the people going on? Newark fell behind in, in high school going at the time that there was this tremendous growth, which is responsible for half of the growth in US GDP uh, in the first half of the 20th century. Um, so that's what I have. I do have a paper which goes into this in a lot more detail. It will be on the Newark History Society website by Wednesday once I clean up the mistakes. <laughs> My name is Inge Helling and I'm the vice president of the Schwäbische Sängerbund, which happens to be the last chorus still existing from the 1900 chorus society. And we have several of our singers in the audience today. Uh, a couple of months ago, we attended in the park, Brooks Park, we re-established the bust of Mendelssohn. I don't know if you remember this. And our chorus and some other singers joined us and we participated in this beautiful thing. I just want to mention, we still have the Northeast Singing Society and on June 2nd, we give a concert, a combined concert with about 200 singers not 2000, uh, in North Philadelphia. So we're still working on this, but just have to mention, we are still singing. Uh, I think I have the right to call you Brendan, but I will call you Dan. There's a story in that. We will not go through that. You got, in reference to Wilson Avenue, you should have, or you should take a walk down Wilson Avenue and look at the old Hamburg School, which is known as Wilson Avenue School, and it still says Hamburg School there. Hamburg Place School. Yeah. It's still there. It was, it was first changed to John Monteith School before that. That I didn't know. The second, um, I think the espionage act, uh, should have been would have been uh, considered a reason because in the Espionage Act it says flying the flag of enemies is not appropriate. I don't remember the exact words, and that clearly was referring to the German flag. Uh, you know, as you well know, many of us fly flags: the Irish flag, the Italian flag, Colombian flag, and so on. But even to this very day, I see very few German flags. And all, in reference to migration, we shouldn't forget about uh, Irvington and Union. And I remember in Lyons Avenue in Irvington, the Turner uh, uh, building. Yeah. There, there wasn't a lot. Union by 1920 was still very tiny. Uh, if you look at excess German migration, Irvington is important, but the, the number there is, is on the order of magnitude of 750. I, I, I do that in the paper. And uh, Ir Irvington is important, yeah. uh, but it still doesn't explain what, what happened. And as part of the Germanic influence, uh, the mayor of Union was someone named Beer Temple, 
in like 50 years or something like that. That also, in a way, shows. He, his, his uncle uh, was elected the 12th Ward Councilman as a Democrat and then was elected to the Board of Works around 1912 as a Democrat. And by the way, I'm not German. <laughs> Even though my name my, on my mother's side was very, very German, it was Stettner. And I got a feeling that's one of the reasons uh, my grandfather became a citizen uh, before World War II because he was afraid of the anti-German feelings. And if, if you look at the Metropolitan Opera, which, which Petra Moser did, uh, you don't see anything like World War I happening in World War II. Mm -hmm. uh, the, 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 the percentage of German operas returns to its pre-war level around late 1920s and 1930s and, and continues flat through World War II. And we'll talk afterwards. Good evening. My name is James Bacor. I'm a member of uh, several German Amer American organizations, Deutsche Club, Germania Park, and the German American Heritage Foundation. Uh, I know that uh, you were pointing out uh, a great emphasis on the ironbound section in the East Ward. Um, what mo many people don't know that even though, uh, now I was born on Rome Street, which was previously called Berlin Street, but there is still a section there that is Berlin Street uh, by the trestle where you go towards Hawkins Street underneath the trestle. If you were to look at uh, maps of Newark, you would still see the names of some of these streets, like for example, Hensler Street, where it was originally, they had the Hensler Brewery, which was right near the Wilson Avenue School, uh, which, uh, of course, as the gentleman pointed out, Hamburg Place. There are still streets in the Ironbound that have still maintained their uh, German names. And um, St. Benedict's Church, for example, they, ha they found um, uh, old manuscripts that were written in German and Hungarian, which at one time were the predominant groups there. So uh, I would just like to point that out for those who are not familiar. Uh, if you were to look at some of the old maps you go to City Hall, you will still see uh, some of the original uh, German names of some of these streets. All right. Thank you. Hi, I'm Harold Kravis. I'm, I helped out with the Jewish Museum when we did synagogues of Newark, and that's what I wanted to ask you about. I thought B'nai Jeshrin was the first synagogue of Newark with the German Jews and everything. Uh, well, that's what I thought I was saying. So. <laughs> oh, okay, because I didn't think you said that, but that's Well, what I it. probably didn't. I, oh, I should okay. have consulted you before I said anything. <laughs> Thank you very much, uh, Natalie and uh, Dan. My name is John McTague, and um, I'm just curious uh, further as uh, as far as, uh, as a whole, the German uh, immigration and German settlement uh, in Newark and expanding it further into this uh, very immediate local region. Um, and uh, you also alluded to the fact that Germany did not become a country until uh, 1871, I believe. Uh, now, um, uh, you know, I, I, I know so many uh, incidences like, say, the Benedictine uh, um, monks came in to service uh, the uh, the uh, German Catholic community, and I'm born and raised in Elizabeth, and I know uh, you know churches were set up uh, to accommodate, like St. Michael's, and then I think the Election Brothers uh, is a uh, came in from St. Louis to uh, open Election Brothers Hospital in Elizabeth again to service the. Uh, uh, the German Catholic uh, community. What I'm uh, curious about is, uh, I mean, could uh, a religion serve as, uh, say, a factor in splitting off some of, uh, you know, the German support? And, uh, uh, I mean, could it be where uh, Germans would have more allegiance, say, to uh, uh, the Italian or Irish community because where uh, the, the dominant uh, unifying factor would be religion over there? Uh, Germanic uh, or sharing the uh, uh, German language so uh. um, well not at 
I don't believe at the, at least in the 19th century, that that would have happened. Toward the end of the 19th century, there was a uh, there was a big split between uh, those who wanted German language services and the Irish who were the bishops. Although we have somebody in the back of the room who could no, he says, <laughs> I was going to say who could speak with much more authority than me. Um, but I, I I don't know if Dan, if you know it in the 20th century. 20th, I mean. The Germans were not united, as, as Natalie, the, the Germans were for, for the most part not united on anything. I mean, there, except beer, but I mean, there, there were, the Germans were Republicans, the Germans were Democrats, the Germans were, were so, so, I mean, it's similarly, if you look at what was going on in, in, in 1900s elections, the, the Italians are sometimes Democrats, sometimes, it's, it's not very much, ethnic groups don't correspond to parties. Uh, in uh, aldermanic, in, in aldermanic Newark. Sing, okay. The other thing. Yeah. Well, except that there were multiple uh, singing societies who then got together with the United uh, Newark societies. But but when you look at what their performances, uh, that very often they did. Very often they didn't sing United. They might have part of the performance United, and part of it would feature different groups. Yeah. Right. Right. Mm -hmm. Okay. A lot of them stayed because a lot of them were constricted. They, it wasn't like they came as volunteers. Um, von Ketzler, in, you know, the most recent comprehensive history of Germans in Newark is 1913, which means there's a lot of work to be done, folks. Uh, but he spends part of his time sort of doing an apologetic for, you know, explaining how the Hessians were really good guys. Um, but many of them stayed after the war, I, you know, in, uh, in various parts of the country, and just, yeah, they just assimilated, you know, they, uh, they were here, they didn't want to go back in many cases, and even though in many cases they didn't want to be here in the first place. Um, one thing I can think of is in terms, I think the Germans were much more split than many <laughs> other ethnic groups between, uh, you know, the Irish were mostly Catholic, although a good number of Protestants. The, the Germans are kind of split between the Catholics, the Protestants, but then you had the free thinkers, you had the rebels. Um, so and the Protestants didn't get along either. I mean- No, they, that's right, you had, you're right, you yeah, had all the different yeah. Protestants. Yeah, they would, um, they would complain about, you know, that the, that Protestant group was getting right. Germans, oh, yeah. and that's this right. one was That's why the first German president, second German president, third German uh, and even among the Catholic Church, the St. Peter's on Belmont Avenue, what was Belmont Avenue, was founded because a certain group couldn't stand Nicholas Ballais, the Benedictine, mm -hmm. who was pastor of St. Mary's, and for a lot of good reasons, as I'm finding out. Uh, so they went up there. But also, I, this gives me a chance to make an advertisement. Um, I've been asked by uh, Fordham University Press to propose, make a proposal for a history of St. Mary's Parish. Oh. So uh, if anybody, I'll be happy to give you my email address and what have you, uh, if anybody has... Oh, how things they want to uh, share. Thank you. Hi, thanks. This is great. My name is Mary Beth Saccone. I married an Italian, but my maiden name is Schulke. It's S C H U E L K E. Should have been S C H U Umlaut L K E, which is the way it actually is on my great grandfather's naturalization papers from 1886. In, Essex County Courthouse. Um, and I just wanted to address religion. Um, my father and my brother both graduated from St. Benedict's, my father in 1927. Um, I'm the baby. Um, and uh, many of the brothers were German, spoke German. Um, it was very much a German Catholic organization. Um, and religion played a very big part in the um, wards of Newark, and I, I'm a history teacher. I have my master's in history, um, and I've been doing a lot of research on German Newark over the past couple of years. Um, and my grandfather, uh, when he married in um, 19, 
my father was 1909, 1905. When they married in 1905, he married um, uh, Mary Young, and their family owned a, a celery farm, um, which is now Newark Airport. They sold the land to the city of Newark in 1919. But when he married her, Catholic, and they were what was called black Protestant. They were German Protestants, and his parents um, did not acknowledge her, did not come to the wedding, um, and only finally acknowledged the family when the first child was born. So the, um, the divide in, in Catholicism and Protestantism in both, you know, across both the German and in terms of intermarriage with the Germans and the Irish was very much um, at the forefront. Um, and the other thing that I just want to say, too, is I think we need to take into consideration prohibition. Um, I realize it's after 1917, and I, and I totally agree with the Espionage Act, that, that comment in 1917. You know, I mean, that was clear about, you know, no use of any kind of, um, of what you might call propaganda being a flag um, in support of the enemy, aliens. Um, but also prohibition. I, uh, my grandfather, and I have pictures of him in the... In the, in the uh, brewery, um, made a great living until 1920, um, working for uh, Hensler. Yes? Is it? I, I should, Certainly Hensler was. I, yes, but I believe that was one of the breweries. Yeah. Yeah, yes, exactly. Yes, okay. absolutely. He was their manager. Thank you. I just want to, and, um, and so then he didn't have a job from 1920 to 1933 um, because my Irish grandmother said, you're not bootlegging, you know, that's illegal. And, you know, and so he had to, well, you know, and, my, and I grew up always hearing, you know, we'd be rich, as rich as the Kennedys had my grandfather chose to bootleg. Um, <laughs> true words, you know? So, um, and I'll finish with this. Um, and so in 1933, he got his job back in, you know, in uh, working for, uh, one of the, I don't know if it was the same, I think it might have been the same, I'd have to look. Nonetheless, um, you know, those were 13 dry years. Um, and he ended up uh, working in the car business and, you know, and making a living for himself. But I think, you know, taking a look at what that did to the German economic base in, this, in the city of Newark during those 13 years of prohibition is very much, um, whether or not the po politics in 1917, 1916, 17, 18 impacted, then you have to look at what happened during prohibition with all of the various breweries. Uh, yeah, I think you're absolutely right about the, the breweries. I mean, part of it was the Germans were so identified with the breweries. Um, and, but there was, a, although uh, in uh, 1890, uh, the beer was the second most um, profitable uh, product in Newark yeah. by 1910, I believe it was the 11th. So there was something that was happening before that Temperance. as well. Yeah. Uh, so, so, and and you had you know prohibition clearly coming, and right. then between anti-German sentiment and Germans being associated uh, with brewers, uh, I, I, there was definitely stuff going on. Now, Christian uh, uh, Feigenspahn was actually the president of the United States Brewers Association in 1920, and he was the one that actually tried to personally get an injunction against prohibition being enacted here. Uh, Kruger was the one that actually did the, the they, they actually produced near beer all through prohibition. Yes. And as a result, when prohibition was over, um, Kruger actually, uh, they were still in production. So they were able to re resume production immediately. And in the first 18 hours of post-prohibition, they produced and shipped out 35,000 barrels of beer because people had been waiting. And they were ready <laughs> because they had Newark water. I think I'm, uh, we're going to call it now. Uh, there's so many topics that spread out from this. There are so many echoes from the German presence in, in Newark still. She says uh, and, But I do want to thank Natalie and Dan for walking us through this uh, story tonight. And I hope to see you on June 18th at our next meeting. Thank you.